I'm Shaul Benchai, and today we're going to talk about Kubernetes blind spots, the unseen threat of system pods. So, a little bit about myself. I'm a security researcher in Prisma Cloud at Palo Alto Network, and I'm doing security research and threat hunting in cloud ecosystem, and I'm also dealing with some open source research and vulnerability management. So our lineup topic for today, we'll start to talk about container escape and Kubernetes second stage attack. We will explore this concept and understand why they are so critical for cloud security. Then we'll try to understand better system pods about their function and privileges. Following that, we'll talk about the system pods paradox, privilege against risk, and the unique security challenge around it. Moving on to real-world misconfiguration and vulnerability, we will examine real-world case study combining two default misconfiguration in GKE. And then we will wrap it all to some key recommendation and best practices. So ever since container came into our life, we've been hearing more and more about container escape. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, do containers actually contain? There is no doubt that containers are great for packaging and deploying software. This is the reason why we are all use them. But they are weak security boundary, mostly because of the shared kernel. And container escape will probably continue to happen, and it's here to stay, even because vulnerability or even because misconfiguration. The most known one is privileged container with access to the host. So we must understand what is the impact. What is the impact of container escape? And the obvious impact, in Kubernetes at least, is a compromised node. An attacker escaped from one container or one pod and now took control over the entire node. But let's imagine that our an attacker is an ambitious one, and he might be not satisfied with only a single compromise node. He might want to take over the entire cluster, maybe for more business logic or more compute resources for crypto mining, for example. So one of the questions that we will try to answer today is if a scenario of a single container escape could be escalated to full cluster admin. And what is the part of system pods in this kind of scenario? So before we will dive in, we need to understand a little bit better what is exactly is second stage attack in Kubernetes. So of course, attacker gains some initial access to our environment. And now we want to escalate his privileges or move literally. So our starting point is that container escape already happened. So how exactly we make sure that our environment is protected and strong enough that even if container escape happened, an attacker could not be doing some any significant damage? So let's try to think as an attacker what we will focus and what we will look for in this second stage attack. So as an attacker, probably I want focus on daemon set pods, because daemon, uh, sorry, deployment pods. As an attacker, I probably not focus on deployment pods, because deployment pods handle application instance and compromise them, probably not allow me to access some infrastructure, some, some infrastructure uh, in our cluster. And I really don't know where I land in the cluster, so there is no guarantee that I will meet with deployment pods. Same for user configuration and user management pod. The chance to find some misconfiguration or vulnerability in well-configured and well-management pod are significantly reduced. And of course, low privileges pod. Our goal is to escalate our privileges and give ourselves a higher level of control within the cluster. So this is a list that what 
an attacker will not focus on. And anybody want to guess which kind of pod attacker will focus in second state attack? Demon set. Demon set guarantees us that no matter what, no matter where we land our cluster, we will meet demon set pod in every each node in our cluster. Same for non-user configuration or non-user non -user management. The chance to find any kind of vulnerability or misconfiguration in non-user or non-management pod are significantly increased. And of course, high privileges, because compromised high privileges pod provides extensive control over the cluster. So which kind of pod fit to those requirements? Exactly, system pods. In most cases, system pods deploy as a daemon set, and they was already there when we launched our cluster. We didn't configure them, we didn't set their permission. We just inherit them by creating a cluster. And by their nature, and in order to operate, they need high privileges. So we understood that system pods are very special, special pods. So let's try to understand and get to know them better. So as a definition, we can say that they are responsible for executing key tasks and maintaining the cluster overall functionality, and play pivotal role in managing critical component and ensure smooth operation of the cluster. And basically, they are the architecture behind the scenes. And with this kind of operation, they need to evaluate privilege to perform this critical task. So we all know that great power comes with great responsibility, as these privileges is must by their nature and must have in order to operate. But we must use it wisely to ensure the security and the integrity of our cluster. So in the following slide, we will explore a couple of different groups of system pods in Kubernetes. This is not all the groups, but probably the most common ones. So the first group is storage pod. And do their function, they need access to sensitive paths, which significantly increase the attack surface of our cluster and makes them very attractive for attackers. Because if an attacker can exploit vulnerability or misconfiguration in storage pod, he could gain unauthorized access to sensitive data that's stored on the host. The next group is monitoring and logging aggregation pod. Maintaining healthy and secure cluster require monitoring and logging, right? So those pods play critical role by collecting and aggregating data from various pods within the cluster. But they also increase our attack surface. And part of the collection process of those pods require level of interaction with, the, with pods, nodes, and the Kubernetes API itself. So this group also expands the attack surface of our cluster. Another group <coughs> is secret management pods, which play a critical role in managing life cycle of secret use within the Kubernetes environment. And they have very high permission because they need access, they have access to API token, password, certificate that's stored within the cluster. So this group also increases our attack surface. And the final group is, our net, is network pods that's responsible for mapping network routing and load balancing within the Kubernetes cluster. And attacker may target these pods to manipulate network traffic, intercept communication between pods or services, or even launch a denial of service attack. So this table summarizes everything we said about the different group of system pods, which high privilege each group has, how each group increased the attack surface of our cluster, and why the attractive target for an attacker. So it was very easy to know that system pods are very special. They are essential for core functionality, but also introduce a security risk. This is exactly what's create the system pods paradox. The heart of the paradox lays on the fundamental tension 
the need to privileges to ensure core functionality versus inherent security risk associated to those privileges. Without, without system pods, the cluster will not be able to function properly. So the required evident privileges included resource manipulation, like create the ability to create, modify, or delete resources, network setting, like configure the pod communication within the cluster, and the price of this power is that any kind of misconfiguration in those pods will be a critical misconfiguration that probably allow some unauthorized access to our cluster, which make those pods a very high value target. As an attacker, it's worth to spend some time to find any kind of security or vulnerability in those kind of pods because probably they will allow us to move literally and in the best case or the worst case, it depends, allow us complete compromise of the cluster. And some optimistic notes, this paradox is manageable. With proactive approach that mitigate the inherent security risk, we can grant them the only minimum level of access they need to operate and limit the network access of system ports whatever is possible. And finally, and of course, the proactive monitoring and logging system ports activity. By treating every operation as a potential suspicious activity. So it was a lot of information in a very short time. So let's do some short recap. We talk about container escape that unfortunately will continue to happen. And we emphasize the importance to shift the focus to the second stage attack. What happened after container escape will happen. Then we will dive into the critical role of system pods in Kubernetes. And finally, we talk about the security paradox, that with great power comes great responsibility. So now that we are all aligned, we can move on to the artistic part of the talk, the dual privilege escalation chain. This chain combining two misconfiguration, two default misconfiguration in GKE. And each misconfiguration not allow an attacker to do any significant damage, but combine them then together, allow us to escalate our privileges and operate as a cluster admin. So let's get to know the component of the chain. The first component is FluidBit. FluidBit become last year the official logging agent of every GKE cluster. It's deployed as a daemon set, and just we describe at the table about logging and monitoring, by their nature, they need access to and some privileges to every pod in the cluster, which increase our attack surface for privilege escalation. This is the reason why I look for some misconfiguration in FluentBit. The second component is Anthos Service Mesh, which is the Google implementation for Istio project. It's an add-on in GKE, which need to be enabled. As, and ad, as we saw in the previous table, network pods need Avalet privileges in order to manage network routing and load balancing and pod communication. So, we have two prerequisites in our attack. First is container escape, because we are talking about second stage attack. And the second prerequisite is Anthos service mesh will be enabled. So two days ago, here in KubeCon, Google have a great talk about Anthos service mesh. And according to them, the number of users enabling Anthos 
is simply huge. And they're implementing it in more and more feature. So it's not quite rare that Anto service mesh is enabling in our cluster. The first misconfiguration is that the fluent bit mounted the varlib kubelet pods volume. And it's not necessary in order to operate. And under this volume, we can find the service account token of each pod in our node. So it's nice. We can map the entire cluster. But our goal is cluster admin. So what next? So with the first misconfiguration of FluentBit, I can control the end of service mesh container network interface token. And the misconfiguration in Entos is that he keep his high privileges after the first installation. In the first installation, the installation CNI need high privileges to create pod, configure the network, and so on. But after the first installation completed, he doesn't need it, need it anymore. So this was the second misconfiguration that the CNI demon said to retain his high privileges after the first installation. So I escaped from container, and I met two demon set. And with the help of the misconfiguration in FluidBit, I can reach the service account token of the Ento service mesh, which allow me to impersonate and take advantage the fact that he retain his privileges and create a pod. Cool, very nice, but not enough because I want to be a cluster admin. So, luckily for me, in GKE, the Cube system namespace offer a number of pre extre extremely powerful service account. And the cluster role aggregation controller service account, which I call CRACK, is the leading candidate. As it can add arbitrary permission to existing cluster role. So I can update the cluster wall bound to crack to possess all privileges. So let's connect it all together. I will grant the crack service account to the pod I can create with the Ento service mesh permission and save the token in one of the volume folder which I have access with the first mis misconfiguration of FluentBit. And once I have control on the crack service account token, I could escalate at my own privileges and operate as a cluster admin. So enough talking, let's see it in action. So, Just a sec, okay. I'm using here uh, my own script that imitate container escape and also installing kubectl and static bash and all the things I need to launch the attack. And now I'm taking control on the fluid bit pod. All the attack is operated from the fluid bit pod only. Here I verify that I'm on the fluent bit pod. And now I'm taking the advantage that, ah, now I can see that I have only permission to, to get a pod. This is only permission that I have in fluent bit pod. And now I'm taking advantage the fact that fluent bit mounts the varli kubelet pod volume. So now I can see all the folder, all the 
volumes of all the pods in my nodes. So I'll go straight to the Istio CNL installer. And look under his folder where is his token locate. So I find this token, and now I will check which kind of permission I have when I'm controlling the CNI installer token. So as you can see, now I'm have more permission, and I can create a pod. So I prepare in advance some pod YAML to create a simple pod, and grant it the cluster all aggregation controller service account token, and immediately escalate his own privileges to be able to do any kind of operation in any kind of name namespace in the cluster, and save the token in some TXT file under the, some shared volume that I have access to with the Fluent Bit misconfiguration. So I will create the pod. I verify that the pod is running. And back to the varlib kubelet pods, I will search for the, this TXT file. It will be under one of the volumes here. So I found it, and now I can use it I'm going to the pod that where this file is located. And I will see which kind of operation and which kind of formation I have with this, with this token. And I see that my RBAC is full of stars, which means that I can do any kind of operation within the cluster and operate as a cluster admin. Thank you. So about the disclosure and fixes. So at the end of 2023, GKE fixed both issue by reducing and hardening the fluent bit permission. It no longer mount the varli pod, kubelet pod uh, volume. 
and do some archi architecture change in end of service mesh, and now we cannot create pod anymore after the first installation completed. You can see the fixed inversion. And for some key recommendations. So just like a marathon, securing Kubernetes is not a one-time effort. It's an ongoing process that requires continuous and sustained effort and commitment. System pods deserve special security attention because they are the gatekeeper of our cluster. And in order to manage the paradox, we need special security intention and special treatment for those system pods. Every interaction, every permission, every configuration related to system pods require justification. And as it comes to system pods, we need extra caution when configuring the permission. So we must ensure that each action and access level is justified and aligned with the security best practices. So this is a QR code to the dual privilege escalation blog that I wrote in last December. It's a very detailed and technical blog that elaborates more about the attack. And I would like to take any question if, there, if, if you have, and feel free also to come offline and ask some questions.